with you. First, I would like you to put you, of course, very shortly, yeah, uh, within the historical context. The material I'm going to speak about comes from the beginning of the 4th century BC. In Athens, this is a very complicated and difficult period. For three decades, Athens and the allies were involved in the disastrous war with Spartan League. Athens eventually lost. In the middle of the war, Athenians, induced by Alcibiades, invaded Sicily, and the expedition turned, to, turned out to be a complete disaster. Some, lace, some years after, the first of the oligarchy coup in this century um, took place. It was in 411. It was a relatively short period called Government on four, or 400. In the end of the war, there was another putsch, this time much more bloody, much more brutal and violent. It was called the Rule of 30 Tyrants, 404 up to 403. I'm going also to refer to uh, some vital um, individuals. First of all, Alcibiades the Elder, so the famous Alcibiades, and Nikias, both famous Athenian generals and politicians, and as a matter of fact, political opponents as well. I'm going also to refer to the work of Thucydides, the famous uh, uh, historian who wrote the monography of Peloponnesian War, and, and first of all, to Lysias the speechwriter and writer who provided uh, forensic speeches for litigants in Athenian courts. Before I proceed, I should also say that all my conclusions are to some extent hypothetical, since uh, all the source material is not complete. We have quite a lot of forensic speech coming from this period, but still the sources are quite fragmentary. Both speeches I'm going to refer to belong to the, uh, and the speeches being the 14th speech against Alcibiades I and the 18th speech um, concerning the property of brother of Nikias. All the speeches belong to the category of so-called public charges called graffae, uh, which were treated really seriously. Many of these offenses were in danger of uh, capital punishment as well. It would be, of course, a truism to say that the opinion of the parents was vital for their offspring life and career. Noble and homeless ancestors when considered a most valuable asset for the next generations. But real or imaginary sins of the fathers influence the lives of their children a lot. It could be understandable in the case of political career and public relations, but the most significant examples came from court, where sons could be paying for their father's deeds. And I'm, of course, I'm not referring to banal cases of inherited debts, because uh, that would be out of the question in this, in, in, this, in this paper. In my paper, I would like to focus on two legal cases referring to Alcibiades the Younger and the son of Eucrates. The former was accused of desertion, and it may be argued the opinion of his famous father played a crucial role in the argument of the prosecutor. The latter was in danger of losing both his civil rights and his inherited property. The father of the Alcibiades the Younger happens to be one of the most intriguing individuals of the 5th century. Alcibiades the, El the Elder, it means Alcibiades III, aristocrat general whose lifestyle became a subject of public interest and assured him the position of a real celebrity, natural born star, in the great part owes his place in history to Thucydides. Famous historian seems to be fascinated by Alcibiades' personality. He appreciates many talents possessed by the son of Cleinias, especially his bravery and ability to take decisions, but he's fully aware of the way Alcibiades' private life influenced his opinion among the fellow countrymen. Alcibiades, with his love of luxury goods, inclination to show off and passion to risk, was at the same time admired and feared. If we are to believe Thucydides, the Athenians might think that Alcibiades' desire of great deeds and glory comparable to those of the legendary heroes could lead this untamed individual to reach for tyranny and ruin of the political system. As you may see, Alcibiades' political career was a rather unstable one. Once he was on the side of his uh, country, Athens, then he changed alliances, and uh, for several years he served as advisor, military advisor to Sparta, then came back to Athens to fled once more and finally be killed in Phrygia. As you see, the complicated story of Alcibiades' life made the fears of his fellow countrymen at least partly understandable. 
The general conclusion was that Alcibiades had all the qualities, personal charm and charisma included, necessary to become a great national hero and prominent political leader. Unfortunately, his vices could turn him into serious danger to his own city. With such a family history, Alcibiades IV had no easy position to start. Even before he was accused of alleged desertion, he had to face charges connected with the alleged deaths of his father. But we are, but we are not going to talk about it now. The case I would like to bring to your attention refers to Alcibiades the Younger himself. However, even facing the Athenian judges in his own trial, the young man was still standing in the long shadow of his famous father. In 395, he was accused of desertion by uh, Arhestratides. We didn't know much about this uh, person. The main charge was supported by two speeches provided by Lysias and held by a speaker presenting himself as the private enemy of Alcibiades. There are the speeches 14 and 15 among Lysias' writings. We do not know anything about the accuser, and we do not possess his speech. We do not know who wrote the defense, neither. We don't know anything about the verdict as well. <laughs> so, the fact seems to be quite clear. The son of Alcibiades, at the time 21 years old, was enrolled by the magistrates in the heavy infantry. Instead of presenting himself at his regiment, he began his service in the cavalry. It should be said as well that there was no battle in the meantime and he did not abandon the infantry in the battlefield. During the trial, the cavalry commander spoke in his favor and claimed that he had joined the horseman's squad on their own command. The problem was that Athenian generals were not legally entitled to move a soldier from infantry to cavalry. The way to cavalry led through a special procedure. A candidate had to undergo a special scrutiny and gain the magistrate's approval. Alcibiades obviously failed to fulfill his duty and joined cavalry on his own will. Such a ditch resulted in martial court, the judges being soldiers and generals, and the accusation which combined two main charges, deserting the ranks, so-called lipotaxia, and refusal of military service, so-called astrateia. Both might, might involve the additional charge of cowardice. To understand the reason of the accusation, it's important to remember that at that time, heavy infantry was still the decisive factor on the battlefield, and the service in its ranks was more respected than the others. In addition, heavy infantry composed of the citizens, brothers in arms, equally ready to give their lives for the country, could be seen in the most important force of the democratic state. The service in the cavalry was thought to be easier and less dangerous, so choosing it instead of infantry could be treated as avoiding danger. What is more, it implied rather aristocratic inclinations. The latter was probably the case with Alcibiades, who might believe that the service on the horseback would be much more becoming to the offspring of the Alcmonidae family. I'm certainly not going to defend Alcibiades' son. We do not know much about his life, and the scandalous detail provided by the accuser were most probably exaggerated to a great extent. For instance, the accusation that he um, gave away his own father, that he betrayed him. It's rather difficult to believe that 11 years old boy was capable of such a deed at a real danger to his experienced father. Uh, however, there are reasons to believe that young Alcibiades inherited most of his father's vices, but not too many of his virtues. We might assume that he tried to match his father's fame and lifestyle, but lacked both his personal charisma and financial resources. What I would like today to, to demonstrate is that bad opinion of his father provided a vital argument for the accusation. What made this trial exceptional is the fact that it was the first such case after the end of the Peloponnesian War. As the speaker emphasized, the decision of the judges would have a great impact on the other verdicts in similar situations. The charge itself is a little ambiguous. The distinction between desertion and refusal of military service was not clear cut. It seems that much depended on the opinion of the judges in a particular case. Even the speaker in this case considered it necessary to remind the listeners of the law and to offer such an interpretation that the charge would become understandable. He admits that the opinion of what should and what should not be regarded as desertion is not unanimous. Some people believe that there can be no, no question of desertion and cowardice where there is no actually military operation going on. 
For the speaker, however, the law has much broader meaning and refers also to people who did not fulfill their military duty and did not turn up in their regiments. Thus, the two charges became combined. The conclusion the speaker draws is detrimental for the young Alcibiades. In the accuser's opinion, he deserves to be prosecuted for, military, for refusal of military service and desertion, and for cowardice in addition. The second line of accusation considers the disregard for the appropriate procedure in enrolling the cavalry. Thus, young Alcibiades showed the utmost disrespect for the law and for his fellow citizens, at the same time proving his own lack of responsibility. The consequences of such a lack of discipline may be disastrous, of course, in the speaker's opinion, for the whole community. What would happen to the public order if Alcibiades' insolence became popular and repeated by others? The speaker easily reaches high notes and wars against the destruction of the state. The expression used in the speech resembles these used by Thucydides in reference to Alcibiades the Elder. He also speaks about uh, the destruction of the state, of abolishing the system, the democracy, of not obeying the laws, of disregarding the laws, and so on. Additionally, the speaker emphasizes that the young men chose cavalry not to mingle with the ordinary citizens, and this inclination to distinguish himself used to be characteristic of his father. After presenting appropriate laws, the speaker proceeds the broader sense of the punishment and its impact on the others. Punishing the well-known person would be much more profitable for the state than passing the verdict guilty on someone completely <coughs> unknown to the public opinion. In this respect, punishment of the Alcibiades' son should become an example for the posterity, especially that the defendant seeks protection of high officers. Further, the speaker is concerned about the personal character of the defendant, as his ethical attitude could wait upon the verdict and finds that young man is highly corrupted. The family background and the story of his father in particular do not provide any positive argument for the defense either. The speaker dwells on the subject in several paragraphs and closes his speech with the enumeration of all the mistakes and crimes committed by the defendant's father, as if he wanted to leave the audience with the strong image of what might happen if the next generation of Alcibiades' family is not stopped at the early stage of its activity. Of course, one might say that depicting a defendant's character is common judicial practice even today. But in the Athenian court, it had more bearing on the case that one should expect. A few decades later, Aristotle, in his book on rhetoric, will explain that the fault in character of an individual is the source of his or her crimes. Someone's nature is one of the main factors responsible for a crime. It is the extent of the wickedness which was the source of the crime which decides about its evaluation. Thus, even a small offense could become very dangerous if it was born by a really corrupted and wicked heart. It may be inferred from these words that, this, that it is not only the consequences of the crime that should be taken into consideration by the court, by the general moral attitude of a culprit, if his and her moral disposition prove that he or she is able to commit greater crimes, this should be considered in passing the verdict even if these crimes had not been committed yet. To support this line of reasoning, the speaker refers to Alcibiades the Elder. Deeds of the father increase the probability of his sons doing exactly the same. For the speaker, this seems to be much more than hypothetical reasoning. There are two passages in the speech that enlighten that attitude, this attitude of the accuser. Let me show you this. First, in the paragraph 16, in reference to Alcibiades the Elder, the speaker says, if you put this man, mainly Alcib meaning Alcibiades the Elder, to death at this man's age, uh, at, that refers to his son, the first time you caught him offending against you, the city would have escaped her great disaster. And a few paragraphs later, a general remark, for you allow those speaking in defense to discourse on their merits and on the services rendered by their ancestor, ancestors. And therefore, it is fair that you should listen also to accusers when they expose the many crimes that the defenders have committed against you and the many evils that their ancestors have brought about. These two sentences are the key to understanding the oratory technique and the line of argument of the accuser. It is not only the offense itself, but the character and inclinations of the offender that need to be punished. 
If it were possible, the speaker would opt for the capital punishment. At least he believes that it is exactly what Altibiades the Younger deserves. Uh, as a matter of fact, this offense was um, usually punished with, uh, with exile, with uh, confiscation of property, or with partial or, or total loss of uh, civil rights, but usually not with death. On the other hand, if we consider the structure of the speech and the length of the text devoted to Alcibiades the Elder's mischief, we might think that the character of this particular culprit would not have been even such a problem had not his father been who he was. It is also obvious that the punishment of the young man is to be treated not only as the retribution for, the kind, for his crime, but above all, as the mean of preventing him from doing something worse. It would be also reasonable to mention that in, the, uh, in any of the extant speeches of Lysias, most of them regarding charges connected with public offenses, the issue of the character and ancestors of the defendant is treated with such a determination, with one exception. And um, this would be the son of Eucrat, uh, the son of Eucrates case. There we have to deal with the lack of consequence of the Athenian court and the desperate appeal of the defendant reminding the heroic history of his family in order to save his inheritance and civil rights. Unfortunately, we possess only part of the speech of Lysias, so our knowledge of the context is rather patchy. We know that the famous and tragic Athenian general Nicias, killed at the end of a disastrous Sicilian expedition, which he fiercely opposed, as a matter of fact, had two brothers, Eucrates and Diognetus. Eucrates was sentenced to death and killed during the reign of the Thirty Tyrants, while his brother Diognetus left the city with the other democrats and came back after the restoration of democracy, and soon he died. At that moment, a person called Polyhos came with a proposal that the property of late Eucrates should be confiscated. We do not know on what ground. One may only assume the charge could refer to the mishandling of the public funds. The vital piece of information, however, is provided by the speaker, by the, by the, by the defendant. And if you are to believe his words, uh, the first proposal was dismissed and its author was punished with 1,000 trachmas fine, which means that he did not manage to gain the support of the one-fifth of the judges. So they thought this first proposal completely unreliable and just rubbish. At the time of Eucrates, some were still minor. In a few years later, in 396 BC, Polyhos came back with his demand, and this time, to the, to, to, to the astonishment of the defendant, the proposal was accepted for further investigation. I have, uh, at this time, uh, I have uh, no knowledge of any similar case, of reopening case which had already been once dismissed. This decision, rather unexpected, contradicted the previous one. If the young man, and it was the elder son uh, of Eucrates who spoke in the court, had to fight with alleged offense of his father, it was natural that he used whatever resources he had to prove that nothing in the recent history of his family justifies such an accusation. As a matter of fact, the defendant used the same technique as was presented in the previous speech, but on the reverse. He indulges into his family history in order to gain sympathy of the judges and to convince the audience, using the argument of probability, that his brother, his cousin, and he will be always good and just citizens if it may be judged from their behavior so far and from the lives of their closest relatives. We do not know the result of the speech. We don't know the verdict, but it seems that the speaker builds quite a strong case according to the contemporary standards. His uncle was Nikias, the brave and righteous Athenian general who rendered countless services for the state. Thucydides commented on his death that there, were, that there was no person who would less deserve such a fate. His father, Eucrates, declined the offer of the 30 tyrants to join the government, opposed to the overthrowing of democracy, and paid for this with his own life. His cousin, Nicaratos, Nikias' son, was also arrested and put to death by the tyrants. Diognetus, Nikias' second brother, during the tyrants' reign, had to suffer exile. The defendant, his brother and cousin, together fulfill the financial services for the state out of the inherited property. Whenever the state is in need, it can rely 
on their generosity. Their character and previous behavior and the history of their ancestors prove their loyalty to the state and provide the argument for the future. If the judges vote in favor of the defendants, it would be possible uh, it would be a positive example for the rest of the citizens ready to serve the state with their money and lives. They can only appeal to the hearts and senses of justice of the audience since there is virtually no one who could testify in their case. All the possible witnesses are already dead and some of them lost their lives for the city. The paragraph referring to Nicaratos reveals the feeling of the speaker. His relatives, thanks to their background, social standing and wealth, could easily find a comfortable place among oligarchy. Yet, they always consequently served the democratic state, were loyal and paid for this with their lives and fortunes. And all this to lose their property as alleged enemies of the people after democracy was restored? How sad and unjust. These bitter words suggest that the charge was somehow connected with the public duties performed by late Eucrates. Perhaps the accuser tried to prove that the late brother of Nicias used public money not in the best way he could and caused some hypothetical financial loss to the state. As it is well known the fact that the Athenian magistrates used to be prosecuted for unintentionally caused damage, it is quite possible that Eucrates faced similar accusation. The technique and the, and the argumentation used by the speaker resembles that used in the previous speech. Family history and ancestors' opinion could be used either in accusation or in defense. We do not know whether Eucrates' son was acquitted or sentenced to the property confiscation. But we might suspect that if the judges voted in his favor, it had to do with the past of his family and his personal character. Personally, I would like to think that they managed to convince the judges. Thank you for your attention.